Cody. Thank you, creatives. I'm so excited to be here. Good morning. How are you? Morning. Good morning. I don't know what to do with my book, so I'm going to throw it down. And I'll pick it back up in a little bit. Um, before I get started talking with you today, I do want to give an additional shout out. Uh, thank you to everybody who's here that I know. I love you, and it's really important to me to have your smiling face in the audience. And also, Make a Mark is an incredible, incredible gift that the creative community gives to small nonprofits in the area. Amy is in the audience and her team. Um, so she volunteered her time. Yay! She volunteered her time, and Crabtree Farms was a recipient of Make a Mark, and it has completely catalyzed and changed how we present in the world and the way that we communicate with others. They did a complete rebrand um, and then Riverworks Marketing did a website for us based on that rebrand. And like, I just feel more at home um, as a member of Crabtree Farms and how we relate to the community. So thank you for what you do. You all do incredible work and a special shout out and thank you to anybody who wishes to volunteer for Make a Mark. Let's make a mark. Let's make it work. <laughs> so, thanks. All right, so roots is a really fun topic because it can go everywhere, right? Like clearly they were like, oh, the farm should come and we should talk about roots with the farm. And so we are, but I'm not only gonna talk about beets and carrots and radishes and rutabagas today. So if that's why you're here, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna branch out a little bit. I'm gonna branch out a little bit because to me, roots have always been um, food has always been at the root of human gathering, right? Food has always been at the root of human gathering. So in the Pleistocene, way back, that's the Ice Age, by the way, that's like 12,000 years ago. There were small bands of humans and they were based on hunter, gatherer, foraging bands, right? There were 50 people or fewer, they went out into the world and they, they did what they could do. We think, it is, it is thought, that the rise of kind of social human behavior and larger groupings is due to the warming that happened in the Holocene, which is about 10,000 years ago. And that enabled agriculture, right? So kind of, I could say, and people have said, that agriculture is a root of more complex social gatherings and human groupings. Right? As people could gather together in larger groups, their populations grew and there's a scientific and also um, it's used both in the hard sciences, the natural sciences, the physical sciences, as well as the social sciences, that as you increase quantity at some point there's a quality shift. So as we increased population, as we increased the size of these bands that became tribes, there became a quality shift in our communities. And we began to, we, we began to um, emerge different and new social behaviors, right? So that's a root. I think also we should talk about plant roots because clearly I'm a farmer. So plant roots, what are plant roots? Like why do we care about plant roots? Plant roots and plant health are intricately tied. Your plant root is the sign of health and hardiness and immunity of your plant. I always relate, when I teach workshops, I relate plant root systems to like your immune system, like your lymphatic system, right? Um, so when I talk to beginning gardeners, I might say, let's, let's think about watering. You all love plants, or you think that you're going to love plants, or you want to love plants, and so you want to love your baby every day because it's your baby and you just feel so nourishing and it's so exciting. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it because then your plant has shallow roots. It grows to depend upon a little bit of water every day, a little bit of water every day. And while that feels really loving at, to you, and maybe it feels really loving to the plant, what happens when you wanna go away for the weekend? What happens when it gets to be 110 degrees and you can't water it every three hours, right? We need to do deep waterings. Few deep waterings inspire deep roots. There might be an image back here somewhere of that. Um, <laughs> not of that. <laughs> we also just like stop it, reconnect, you're good whenever you're good. Um, we also talk about root disturbance when we transplant plants. So there are some plants 
that do best when they're transplanted because they already have a competitive edge on life. You're giving them roots as you put them into the ground and they're like, woo, I can beat everybody around me. I'm a hot shot and it's awesome, right? But there are other plants that you shouldn't transplant. You can't take a carrot, you can, it's a terrible idea, but take a carrot and transplant it into the earth. Because in so doing, you're taking its, its world, its life, its universe, that it has known from seed to whenever you're planting it out. And you're disturbing the root. And what do we eat in the carrot? We eat the root, right? So carrots, beets, radishes, rutabagas, things like that, sweet potatoes. You don't want to transplant those because you want to honor the root and you want to honor the fact that they're going to grow best and most fecund in space, in situ, right? And then the other thing I want to talk about with roots, I will get to the point, I promise. Um, the other thing I think, when I think about roots, is I think about the actual root crop, right? I think about carrots, and I think about beets. And, and what I think about when I think about those is I think about people who are new to the farm. You know, because for me, 10 years in, a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. Right? Like, we grow the best carrots in Chattanooga. <laughs> Mark my word. Like, it's true. And if you don't believe me, go to the farmer's market, try them. You will be converted and you will never be able to buy a store bought carrot ever again in your life. You'll be like, where is Sarah's carrots? I need them. They're so good. Um, but it's an amazing thing when you take the garden fork outside and you stick it in the soil and you pull it back and you reach down and you pull out the carrot. It's like magic. <laughs> it's magic. It's, it's the jaw dropping, it's the most magical thing I do on the farm, is pull something out of the ground. Food out of the ground. Like, tomatoes, magic, not the same kind, right? You can see them, they're like, oh look, tomatoes. Most actually kids say, oh look, apples. And you're like, oh babies, this is why you're on the farm with me today, because no, those aren't apples, those are tomatoes. And let's try them now, so that way I can prove it to you. Um, but it's magic. It's a magical thing. Um, roots and root crops can be three and a half times or more the biomass as the above ground biomass, right? When you look at a tree, you're looking at something beautiful, but there's an equal, if not greater, amount below the surface. We don't get to study that because it's really darn hard to study what's below the surface of the earth. They're, they, like scientists, they'll figure out a way, right? And they have been. But it's really hard, but it's amazing and magical. Um, they're nutrient rich, they're nourishing, right? Just the idea of roots. So I wanna go with this theme. Like, Sarah, what's your point? Where are you going? Where are you heading? What's going on? This is where we get to reconnect. The root of what we are trying to do at Crabtree Farms is to connect or to reconnect folks. So one of the ways that we want to do that is we want to reconnect people to the idea and the art of gathering, what you're doing today, right? Um, like ancient peoples, they were, bind, they were bound by kinship groups. And in the rise of agriculture, they moved outside of kinship groups. They began to meet new people and have new social experiences. Folks who they maybe didn't have a connection or a quality or a root, a known root that was shared between them, they formed and forged a new one, right? So at Crabtree Farms, so what we wanna do is we wanna bring people out, we wanna bring them into our UPIC berry patch and we wanna get them talking and we want them to bump into one another and people with no shared ties, we want them to now have this, um, this, this moment together a moment where, and they may have no history that is similar, except, mmm, blueberries taste good. <laughs> right, like, I'm here for blueberries, and you're here for blueberries, and sun-ripened blueberries are amazing. They're not gassed, I love them, and this is fun. And, and that's a magical moment, right? So I equate that to ungloving, to ungloving our unknowingly accrued isolation as humans. Um, we're stripping away the anonymity of other. So if you'll allow me, I have a little excerpt from Mark Nepo that I would like to share with you about this idea, this idea of being direct. When we hesitate in being direct, 
we unknowingly slip something on. We unknowingly slip something on. Something, some added layer of protection that keeps us from feeling the world. And often, that thin covering is the beginning of a loneliness, which, if not put down, diminishes our chances for joy. It's like wearing gloves every time we touch something. And then, forgetting we chose to put them on, we complain that nothing feels quite real. In this way, our challenge each day is not to get dressed to face the world, but to unglove ourselves so that the doorknob feels cold, and the car handle feels wet, and the kiss goodbye feels like the lips of another being, soft and unrepeatable. Right? That's what we're doing. That's what we want to do at Crabtree Farms. We want to reconnect folks to each other. We want to reconnect folks to a sense of place. We want to, ooh, I had it too far away from me. Sorry, guys. Uh, we want to bring them a sense of rhythm, a sense of season, the smell and the sensation of a physical geography. We want them to be able to feel that a shift in humidity signifies a shift in season, maybe into spring, maybe into summer, maybe back into fall. That fresh arugula means that we have cool days. That the presence of fresh peppers means that it's mid to late summer. That sweet potatoes are the harbingers of fall. We are trying to reconnect people to land, to dirt, to food, and the experience of shared effort leading to measurable effect. But these are like quasi-metaphysical goals <laughs> and roots of our effort. So what tangibly does Crabtree Farms work to do? Our work is aimed at two things. One, to encourage a thoughtful relationship with food and or food systems. And two, to use agricultural processes, the process, the doing of farming, to address root needs in our community. That's why we invite kiddos, youth, teens, young adults, onto the farm. That's why we're in the early stages of developing a program for neighborhood youth, a program that allows them tangible work and allows them to bring home a much needed monetary resource to their families. This is our way, we think, to participate as best we can in the efforts to disrupt the cycles of poverty. This is why we educate. This is why we invite kids out to have experiential field trips, to touch, taste, and feel their way across the farm. This is why we have a dazzling array of workshops so that people of all stripes can come to the farm and we can capture them, regardless of how green your thumb is, right? We have a really fantastic cocktails class, just saying. Um, regardless of whether you have land to steward or not, we have a way for you to engage. And if nothing else, we have a beautiful Evelyn Center and a beautiful piece of property. You can come and you can do what you do, whatever that is. You can meet, you can gather in our space with us. We work to spark wonder, to seed a sense of place. Crabtree Farms is a matriculation spot, a place for newcomers and transplants to the area. It's how I came to love Chattanooga. It's how I came to have a sense of place. I moved here from California, and heck, that was a crazy transition, right? It was a crazy transition for me. I can't say I was the happiest, but I found Crabtree, and Crabtree taught me who and what Chattanooga is. I found a root for myself in my community. It's also our work to feed as many people as possible, whether that's through plant sales or markets or food donations. It's to engage the ecologically curious, to engage the dreamy idealists, the pragmatic preparers, the plant lovers, the food lovers, and the community servers. This is why we do what we do. They said use roots to explain why we do what we do. This is, what, this is why we do what we do, right? This is why we grow. These are the roots of who and what we educate. This is how we connect. The root of an organization like Crabtree Farms is its hardworking staff. 
They're passionate, they're dedicated, they're sacrificing, and they make the magic every day, every day. They're the ones who grow the roots, they're the ones that tile the roots together, they're the ones that are creating and tending and stewarding our network, our map of roots, the tendrils out into the community. And I think our work is important. I think our work is important not just because we feed people. I think our work is important in providing that root and providing that connection because perhaps, maybe, I invite you to consider that our social group has grown too large, right? And that in doing so, our social behaviors have become too specialized and complex and that this has led to disconnection and an unintentional gloving of ourselves. A felt need, perhaps, to protect against the residues and the emotions of being direct. And so, perhaps, like the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, perhaps this is our geologic transition period. Perhaps now is our opportunity. Our opportunity to direct our threshold. If we're reaching a population threshold and a grouping threshold and we are going to experience an abrupt shift in social behavior, I would say that perhaps we could choose to move from the isolated in an individual to the intentionally reconnected smaller group. Maybe, I invite you to consider. Like all, not, all small nonprofits, despite the very real and positive impacts of our work, the root of which has very real needs at all levels and in all areas of our organization. You didn't invite a small nonprofit up here to not make a pitch, right? <laughs> so happily, the solutions to small nonprofit needs don't require heroic efforts. Like the accrued nutrient offerings of roots, the solutions are the accumulated efforts of many. So what is your root tendril going to be? Maybe your root tendril is to share the story and to recruit others. Maybe your root tendril is to supply a small gift of your time or a small gift of your talent or your skill, or a material good, we need wheelbarrows, or, <laughs> or maybe it's money, like, we'll take it all, right? But whatever our shift in social behavior, wherever this direction is gonna go, I don't think it's a given. I don't think it's pre-written that we're going to fall deeper into isolation. I think that there's room for choice. I think that there's room for effort. I think that there's room for intention. And I think together that we can tip the scales. We can shift the graft and we can choose roots. Thank you.